Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Freeman. Uh, I work for Warwickshire Community and Voluntary Action, and uh, commonly known as Carver. And we've worked with Stratford District Council uh, to put this webinar on tonight. Um, I'd like, uh, just as a kickoff, to introduce or let them introduce uh, fellow presenters um, from Stratford District Council. So, uh, uh, Rachel, do you want to kick off? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Rachel Blanchard. I'm a policy planner at Stratford on Avon District Council. And I'm leading about leading on the seal bids that you're going to hear about a bit about this evening. Joe. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Bostoran. I'm the policy manager at Stratford on Avon District Council. Matt. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Neal. I'm the local plans manager at Stratford and Urban District Council, and uh, I'm uh, Rachel's line manager. Thank you very much. Who said men can't multitask? I'm letting people in as I speak. Um, okay. Um, to help with the introduction, I just want to share a few slides, and then we'll hand over to Rachel for the the main body of the uh, of the presentation. Um, bear with me for a second. Um, Okay. So, uh, welcome again um, uh, to the Funding Your Community Projects, uh, a guide to sill and capital funding um, uh, for tonight. So, just a, a few housekeeping issues. Um, please, if you can keep on mute, that would be appreciated. Uh, we will take questions at the end rather than as we go along. Um, but feel free to add any questions in the chat uh, if they uh, uh, come up to you. Um, presentations and all the information discussed will be sent out after the webinar. Uh, and we are recording the webinar as we alerted to you in the confirmation email. Um, um, we will edit that out uh, to down to a, a, a tight, uh, part of the uh, of the webinar. So that's that. Um, now the purpose of um, the webinar is really to raise awareness on the community infrastructure levy, commonly known as SIL, and how to apply. And also at the end, we'll go into signposting to other potential capital funding and how you can get further help. Um, the agenda is, this is the introduction. Uh, we're then going to hand over to Rachel and Stratford District Council colleagues. Uh, after that, there will be a question and answer session. Uh, we'll look at the chat first and then open it up. Uh, if you can not go into the detail potentially of your particular project in any detail, because we have uh, 50 plus people on, uh, we're just not going to have the time. Um, those can be done offline. Uh, but if you've got any generic questions or uh, questions that um, fairly high level or, or uh, you know, we'll, we'll touch on those um, and see how time goes. Um, and also touch on where you can get additional help. Final slide before back hand back to Rachel. Um, just a bit of information about Carver. So we're, we're a charity uh, and we support voluntary and community and social enterprises in Warwickshire. Uh, most of our funding comes from uh, the county council, district councils, boroughs and our own revenue. And the five key areas we get involved in is funding, help groups, and we'll touch on that later. Uh, volunteering, we can help identify volunteers and help you with your management of volunteers, policies, etc. Group development. So if groups want to become a charity or they're struggling, we can help in that respect. Uh, we do particular projects. Um, I'm part funded by Stratford District Council Social Inclusion Partnership, and that is a particular project that uh, covers Stratford District. And we also represent the voluntary and community sector uh, in um, uh, in Warwickshire as well. 
Um, so that's just a, a whiz, whiz, whistle stop um, um, tour or introduction. So over to you, uh, Rachel. Perfect, thank you so much. I just want to apologise in advance, my dog has decided to walk around the room. So if you hear some paws on the floor, that's what it is. I'm hoping it won't interrupt us too much. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So you can see the presentation. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can, Rachel. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the SEAL funding for projects around the community as part of the infrastructure funding statement. Probably first question is what's SEAL, what's infrastructure funding statement? So community infrastructure levy, otherwise known as SEAL, is a charge which is levied by Stratford on District Stratford on Avon District Council and other authorities around the country on new development in their area. The money is collected and allows us as a local authority to fund infrastructure projects that will support the area. So Stratford-on-Avon District Council is soon to be looking for projects to be considered as part of the 2022-2023 infrastructure funding statement. So the infrastructure funding statement includes a list of infrastructure projects or types of infrastructure that the District Council intends to fund, either wholly, partly by the community infrastructure levy that we've got from development in the area, so we're looking for projects that could feature on this list and potentially be funded by the SEAL. So who can apply to be, who, what projects can apply for the SEAL funding? So applications are usually expected to come from statutory infrastructure providers, non-profit organisations, usually schools, community groups, charities, uh, count, parish councils, for projects that demonstrate a wider community benefit. I'll go into some previous examples in a few slides so we can see what, what we're, kind of thing we're looking for. The projects must relate to infrastructure, so such as roads, transport, cycleways are a popular one, schools, education, community facilities, health facilities, sports, recreations, open space, children's playground, youth shelter we've had, those kind of things we're looking for as part of infrastructure. The infrastructure must support the development of the area, so it must have a beneficial, must be beneficial to your area or to the whole of Stratford. And lastly, the proposal must meet six mandatory criteria to be included on the list that I'd, I spoke about earlier. I'm going to go through the criteria now. So these are the six mandatory criteria that any project must meet to be included on the list. So first one. Is the infrastructure essential or important to support new development within the district? Second one, is the infrastructure of district-wide importance and does it deliver district-wide objectives? Does the infrastructure contribute to climate change adaptation or mitigation? Um, is the infrastructure project consistent with the delivery of the development plan? Um, and Fifth one is, does the infrastructure align with other council strategies and partner investments plans? And, oh, I don't think you can see the bottom one. We might be able to. Six, are there any constraints to the delivery of the infrastructure that you're proposing? So those are the six mandatory criteria that you must meet to be included on the list. I'm going to go through a bit about the process now, about how we assess whether you meet those criteria and any other further criteria that you're required to meet. So, the process. Once we've received your application, it, we will assess it against the mandatory criteria. If your project meets the mandatory criteria, then we'll put it on the infrastructure list that I mentioned earlier. Once your project is eligible, once we've determined that your project has met the mandatory criteria and is el eligible to go on the infrastructure list, it will be assessed by a second set of criteria to identify if it is a high priority to receive SIL funding. Only projects that are deemed to be a high priority will then be put to councillors for them to decide which projects will be allocated with the available SIL funds this year. Just going to move forward and I'm going to go through the high priority um, criteria that we expect projects to meet. So there's, there's a few on here. I'll go through them one by one and we can discuss it. If there's any, and then if there's any questions at the end, we can go through those. So discretionary criteria, and this is to be rated a high priority. So number one, have SIL funds already been allocated to this product? 
um, project, sorry. So if yes, it's probably not a high priority for us to fund. If no, we could, it, it does score on our criteria. What are the timescales for delivery of the infrastructure? The, we are kind of looking for more medium to short term projects. That doesn't mean we won't fund long term, but that's kind of what we're looking for in the SEAL funding. Uh, number three, does the proposal have a positive impact on equality? If it does, that's great. It gets a higher scoring point. Uh, does the proposal have a positive impact on health and well-being? Moving on. Does the proposal have a positive impact on biodiversity and the environment? And finally, does the proposal have a positive impact on enterprise and economic activity? So for us to deem a project as high priority, on this scoring side here, it must score a minimum of six points. Okay, so to get the SEAL funding, you need to meet the mandatory criteria and then be deemed high priority in order for it to go to the councillors to decide what projects they will fund with the SEAL money available. So if you look at all that and you think, yeah, probably meet my project meets the mandatory criteria and it's looking like it meets the high priority cr criteria, and you want to submit your project, I'm just going to talk you through how that is possible. So if, oh, Chris, can I just check I'm going okay? Am I going too fast? Do you, is everything keeping up with the presentation? That's fine. That's fine. No, yeah, so, everything's fine. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. So if you would like to submit your project for consideration for SEAL funding, once the bids have opened, we are going to ask, I'm going to send an email out to everyone that's probably on this list and my um, uh, some other list to complete an online form. I'm just going to go through the form now because this is probably the most technical bit of work you're going to have to submit with the project. I have opened it before, let's hope it opens now. So this is the form. We've done it online this time. We do have a paper copy if you would prefer, but we've done it online so it's a bit easier for everyone, I think. So we're looking for details of your organisation. I'm just going to do a whistle stop tour. We can go through it in a bit more detail in the questions if anyone has any. So what is your project? Description of your project. Where is your project located in the area and a location plan if you have one? The benefits of the infrastructure project. Is it consistent with our local plan, the core strategy and any neighbourhood development plans that it might have, the area might have? Why is this project essential to support new development within Stratford on Avon District? Has the project been subject to any consultation, engagement, or community endorsement? Have you been out to the members of the public with this in your area? How does this project contribute to climate change adoption and mitigation? And to what extent does the proposal have a positive impact on equality? A similar questions throughout. What extent does the proposal have on a positive impact for health and well-being? Uh, to what extent does the proposal have a positive impact on the biodiversity and the environment within the district? I think you'll see that these answer kind of the mandatory criteria and the high, high um, priority criteria as well as we go through them. So that's what we'll, we'll use your application form to assess the criteria. To what extent does the proposal have a positive impact on enterprise and economic activity within the district? And then we move on to the cost section. So what is the total capital cost of your project? including any costing plans and phasing. What other funding sources have been identified or explored? So would, without SEAL funding, would it be possible to deliver the infrastructure? Is the project likely to be directly linked to and just necessary as a result of foreseeable development and therefore separate section 106 or section 278 obligation may be justified? We can go through those in the questions if necessary. And what is the capital funding gap that is needed for your project. And then we go into kind of the delivery of the project, who will be responsible, how will the infrastructure be maintained, if it needs to ongoing maintenance, has this been budgeted for, when do you think we will be able to get the infrastructure commenced and finished, and able for people to use it? Does your project depend on any planning permission or any other kind of permission? If your project involves improvements or enhancements to land or buildings, do you have the permission to do this? It links to the first question. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. And then that's the application form. It's quite a long application form, but I think it's necessary for us to be able to assess it properly against the mandatory criteria. So let me go back to my presentation. So 
If you would like some more information on the seal process, um, we haven't done it yet, but if you follow this link when you've got the slides, we're going to update our web page with all the information that you need and a paper copy of the form if you'd rather do it that way or um, the online form to fill in to submit your project. If you've got any questions, if you're doing the application form and you've got any questions or you think of something after this meeting, if you email this email address planning.policy at stratforddc.gov.uk, I will be able to come back to you. I can't help you fill in the application form, but I can definitely help with any questions you have about what do certain questions mean in the application form. Okay, so once you've submitted your project and what happens to it? So we, as the planning policy team, we will assess the bids to decide whether they meet the mandatory criteria and whether they go on the infrastructure list. Bids that meet the criteria to be part of the infrastructure list will then be put to the put in the infrastructure funding statement, along with some other seal work, to be approved by Cabinet. Once the IFS has been approved by Cabinet, we will then assess the bids further to see whether they meet the high priority. And then we will take projects to Cabinet later this year for councillors to decide which of the high priority scoring projects will be allocated seal funding. So previous projects that have been successful, as I mentioned earlier, we've been running this for two years and we've had 22 projects that have been successful in receiving over £3.7 million pounds worth of SEAL funding from the council. So there's a lot of money here. Um, some of the previous projects, I'm, I'm sure you might have seen them around the district, are the refurbishment of Greg Hall in Ulster. The, recently, we've approved for a youth shelter in Morton Morrill and a community garden at Glebe Road in Bishop, Bishopton. So there's some big projects going on here, and that just gives you an idea of what we're looking to fund with the SEAL money. Um, this year, we don't have as much available, but we've got £1.3 million pounds available to fund SEAL projects. Okay. And if you want to look at previous applications or how we've assessed projects, this link here should take you to our Cabinet um, page. And if you look at this SEAL spend appendix two, there'll be a list of projects and how they were assessed in there and applications that were put in as part of the SEAL funding. Okay, I think, yeah, that might be it if we've got any questions. I'll just come out of my um, presentation. Stop sharing. Great, that, that's fantastic, Rachel. Thank you very much for that, very comprehensive. Um, and um, I think the, the form actually is quite, um, user friendly, actually. I think uh, I've seen a lot worse. So <laughs> I <wouldn't, laughs> we do I wouldn't, try. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't uh, deter people with uh, to to apply. Um, what I said is, uh, while people are thinking of, of questions, um, uh, I will look at the chat, see what um, people have uh, asked. Uh, so David has has asked, will the SIL fund be available for those of us outside the Stratford area? within Warwickshire. Uh, I think I know the answer to that, but um, did any of the panel um, hazard a guess? It, it is just for Stratford, people in Stratford district area, I'm afraid. I'm sure Warwick have probably got their own seal funding. I'm not entirely sure, but this is just for inside the Stratford district area. Yes, I would have thought each area potentially has their own seal process. If they uh, do seal, they will have this kind of seal process. I'm not sure what authorities do sell, but if they do, they'll do this kind of process, yeah. So I think it's investigating um, various uh, websites. Yeah. Joe? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to jump in. Yeah, I mean, all the projects today have been from, uh, yeah, organisations or individuals within Stratford District. In theory, it's possible to spend so many outside of the district, but there needs to be a demonstrable benefit. So to meet all the criteria that Rachel went through, the benefit to um, the dis Stratford district so whilst in theory and um, kind of like the national regulations do allow for monies to be spent outside of the district um, it's obviously a much harder bar to you know demonstrate you know for example it could be like well services um, that you know uh, you know a, a bet you know a better connection up to Birmingham or something like that so some of that would be outside the district but it would need to demonstrate that there is that 
tangible benefit to the district as well. So, um, yeah, in the main, it would be probably more than likely that it needs to be in Stratford district. But in theory, it's possible to to uh, give money to organisations outside of the district. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, moving down the list, if a town council has been allocated TC, which I suppose is town council SIL funds, can they still apply for district SIL funding? Joe, are you OK to grab this one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They can do. Um, there's no restriction that um, just because a district parish council has got SIL funds doesn't doesn't prohibit them from applying for um, uh, for district SIL funds. So. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the questions is about um, have alternative sources of funding been explored? So obviously we would come back and ask the question, you know, if, we, if we're if we aware, if somebody's asking for £10,000 and we're aware that the parish council's got £100,000 of so money, is, we'd, we'd, we'd come back and ask the question, well, have you explored with the parish council that they, you know, that their so monies aren't available? But if, it, if it's been explored and they aren't, if those monies have already been committed, um, and there's no alternative sources of funding, but that is quite one of our, our kind of criteria that we, we need to, it needs to be demonstrated that other funding sources have been considered and explored and there aren't any other funding opportunities. Uh, moving on. Sorry, um, Georgina's just come in with a, um, a follow-up, just I thought it'd be best to do it now. If the town council use their SEAL funds for a project, can they apply to SEAL funds from the district for the same project? Um, I'm not quite sure the question. You you wouldn't apply for the same for the same project. You wouldn't. Have, I'm not quite sure. Apply the same money. Georgina the on same. the call. Is she uh, available to clarify uh, that? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Sorry. Uh, so, if the town council use some of their the SIL funds that we've been allocated for a particular project. So for argument's sake, we were putting in a bike lane somewhere, but we didn't have enough to cover it with our own SIL funds. Could we apply to the district council or the county council's SIL pot um, for extra funding for that one project? Yes, absolutely. If you could demonstrate, you know, you're putting in the district council, the parish council's putting in this much, but you haven't got enough to top it up. Um, one of the questions is what's your funding gap and the form that Rachel went through. So yes, that's where you would say, look, we're putting in this much, but we haven't got enough. We've got a funding gap of X. We can't find it from anywhere else. Our only avenue is looking for SIL funds. So yeah, absolutely. You can you can fund it from both SIL, um, parish and district council members. That's fine. Okay. Um, moving down the, uh, the chat. Um... For SIL projects which were submitted last year, can these be resubmitted in revised, edited format? Yes, they can be. We can either keep them on the list or as they are, if they were um, met the manager criteria and put on the list, or they can be resubmitted and edited how you wish and we can reassess them. And I think just to add to that, um, projects that were submitted previously they will need to resubmit or reconfirm that there's been no changes if we don't hear from those uh, submitters we will take them off the list so it needs to be actively those submit you know don't just assume because you put your, your project on the list last year we put the project on the list last year that it will automatically be rolled forward it won't be well automatically rolled forward you need to tell us yes you'd like to continue with because you know, we it could be that the project's been funded, but we're we're not aware of that. So you need to actively say, no, I I this project is nothing's changed about this project. There's still this same amount of funding gap. We still like to put it forward for sale, or there's been a change to the project. The funding gap is now changed to Y, and it was X. Please, can you put, assess it under the new? Um, or in some instances, people withdraw the project because they've been funded through another. They've managed to get funding from another source. So um, it is important that submitters of previous projects proactively tell us if you want, because otherwise, and we have done that in the past where um, people haven't replied, we've taken them off the list. Because if we don't know that your project is still in need of funding, we have to assume that you've had it funded from elsewhere. Manuela, you wanted to follow up your, to your question? Yeah, so um, Joe, will you, will you um, email the 
um, you know, the, the projects, the, the um, those who submitted all these projects in, in the previous year, whether they want to stay on the list, whether they want to submit it again, or do they need to do it? On, and, and when do they need to do it? Who they have to email? I think Rachel's going to include it on, Rachel's going to be sending the email out to everybody. And I think, Rachel, you've got the wording in your email, haven't you? If you've previously submitted a project, you need to tell us if you want to carry it on. So I think it is quite explicit in the email. It just says, just to let me know, I've just replied to the email and just let me know if you want it to be kept on there or removed. I will be emailing everyone that has a project on the list or submitted last year. Um, moving on, what are the time deadlines for each stage of submission? Um, we haven't fine-tuned the exact dates, but it's going to be quite soon. Um, we're just finalising the actual dates, but I would expect it to be coming out in the next um, few weeks. So obviously this session tonight is just to kind of give you a bit of advance warning um, that to expect it um, quite shortly. And then we expect there'll be a six-week window once we open it for response it for submissions to come in, so over the summer time. Like to say that decisions, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> won't be until 24, is that? So we're looking to um, take the IFS. So the IFS is the first step, which will identify which projects are on the list. So we're looking to take that to our cabinet and council in October and then for adoption. And then subsequent to that, we will do the actual allocations based on the high priority scoring that Rachel went through. So that will be November, December time. So we, we're looking by the end of the calendar year, we will have made the next round of allocations. Um, moving on, uh, will SIL funding, will SIL fund part of a bigger long-term project such as a children play area that can be completed in the future? I don't... Um, I'm not no, sure is, is, is Howard on, on the call? How is that different from what um, what we've talked about? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the overall um, expenditure on the project is likely to be about £150,000, but it can be broken down into smaller sub projects, you know, which we might fund over two or three years. From various sources. We've already obtained about £45,000. Just a question of whether we would succeed with a bid for £100,000, £120,000 or whether we're better going for something like £40,000 to do a discrete part of the project. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's maybe considering the criteria that Rachel went through and whether you think the whole project in itself would meet all of the criteria or whether um you know it would be better to it's difficult to say really and uh, without look, knowing the details of the project but um yeah, yeah i mean i guess that in terms of the time scales as well because obviously from the sounds of it the bigger project is going to take longer to deliver whereas doing a, a part of the project would be a shorter delivery window i suppose wouldn't it so it would score more highly in that respect yeah Okay, I understand. Thank you. Um, Paul has asked a question. I think we covered some of it. Uh, what we didn't cover is um, what would be the earliest date funds would be available if, if successful? Well, we normally, so if you are successful in getting an allocation, which would be, as I say, by the end of the year, um, every submitter then has to enter into a legal agreement with the council because obviously the council needs to make sure that the monies are spent on the project that they're allocated for so there does need to be a legal agreement put in place so that if the monies aren't spent within a set period of time then then um, the projects can the money can be allocated to an alternative project and normally within those agreements we we actually transfer the money on commencement of works so what happens is we sign the legal agreement and then when you're starting work, you contact, you email the council and say, we've now started work on this project. Please, can you give us the money, essentially? 
and we will arrange from our, our finance team to get those monies transferred over to you. If there are exceptional circumstances, depending on the project financing, if monies are needed in advance of that or phase payments or such like that, we can we can kind of look at that on a case by case basis. But the general approach is that we pay out the actual monies on um, commencement of development. And there's um, we also put in the legal agreement a deadline for when the monies are going to be spent. So in negotiation with the organisation, we say, well, when do you realistically think you can deliver this project? And we'll, we'll work on that deadline so that if the monies aren't spent within that deadline, we either need to do an extension to the legal agreement or the monies will need to be returned to the council. If, we, if for some reason the, the project falls down and it can't be delivered, then the monies would have to be paid back to the council. Or if there's a delay for a particular reason um, outside of the, everybody's control, then we could we could arrange for an extension to the to the spend, but you know the district council is responsible for making sure the money is spent, which is why we do need those legal agreements in place because um, ultimately we're responsible for making sure the projects, you know, uh, the money is spent in a timely manner. So, so that's the process that answers the question. One that was asked and, and answered in, in the chat, but for those who, who are not looking at the chat, can a project be fully funded from the SIL fund? And Rachel has come back and said, yes, that uh, it can be if other funding op options have been explored. Um, we've got one more on the chat. Um, uh, are the available funds dependent on the development taking place? Um, Yes, so we only so the money that Rachel quoted earlier that we've got 1.3 million pounds in the pot at the moment. That's money that's actually been received. So we only we only get the money from the development once they've commenced work. So there's obviously a lot more money in the pipeline on planning permissions that have been agreed, but they haven't yet commenced. But the money that the 1.3 million that Rachel mentioned, that's actually money that the council is in receipt of. So we've absolutely got that money, and that money is available to allocate. So we only, obviously we only allocate money that we, get, that we have, we are in receipt of and that is guaranteed. Supplementary to uh, Elizabeth's was, what is the normal amount on offer and what is the maximum a single application may receive? So what is the normal amount on offer? I mean, there really isn't a, there really isn't a threshold, really. I mean, I think Rachel probably can update more than me, but I think the recent round of allocations that we've done, we had them from probably four, five thousand, maybe the smallest one, up to one point three million. I think the largest one for the Ellen Badger Hospital in Chipston. So you know, there really isn't a you know an average or a normal. Um, you know, it really is every project on its own merits. Really, I mean, obviously, we can only allocate monies that we've got so inevitably there'll be will we see too many projects to fund so we can't fund everything which is where the high priority assessment comes in and then obviously ultimately it'll be for the council's cabinet um to make the ultimate decisions um but yeah there isn't a there isn't a minimum or a maximum or an average in terms of how much would get funded i think that answers ruth's question as well there isn't a limit to the value of the project, the civil finance. It's just whether we've got the available money and the other projects that have been submitted. Elizabeth, do you want to have a follow on from, from your question? Yes, um, I really wanted to know, is it then worth it? I mean, if a project is like the Shipton one, a hefty one, is it then worth waiting for when you've got a hefty amount of sill to distribute? Well, I mean, there's no guarantee of how much we'll have in the future, I suppose. I mean, we're averaging now about one, one and a half a year million now that because it takes a little while to get up to for still to get up to speed. So um, and obviously there's no guarantee that all monies will be spent this year. The, the councillors can make the decision that they don't want to allocate to any projects this year and roll it all forward. There isn't a deadline for spending the monies. So um so I, I wouldn't necessarily wait, say wait. Um, but yeah, I mean, if your project is 
three million pounds and we've only got 1.3 million pounds in the pot then obviously we're not going to be able to fund that project um if it was split into smaller parts we could say we could fund part of it if if the funding was secured for the rest of it but yeah realistically if it's a really big project then um we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to fully fund it through so no the realistically it's coming up to a million so i mean we would gobble up the whole thing which is a bit unfair on the others <laughs> well but i mean ultimately that will be for the council to councillors to decide whether they want to give the majority of the funding to one project it depends yeah. how 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 that project is rated and scored so um i mean my you know my advice would be put it in you've got nothing to lose if it doesn't get funded and you're still on the list you might be considered next year there's no there's no negatives of being on the list you, you know you've got to be in it to win it as they say so you know i know obviously it's a bit of effort to put the form in and the application in but um you know what my advice would be put it in i think Oh, thanks. Um, so, uh, moving down on the questions, um, is there a, a normal expectation for additional or match funding to be in place? And if so, what proportion? Again, it's not one of the criteria. One of the criteria is have you explored all alternative sources of funding? However, when, you know, members come to look at which, you know, choosing which projects they want to fund you know one of the factors they may consider is the amount of match funding that a project has received so the more match funding that a project can get then i'm sure that that would be a factor to be considered by although it's not a formal criteria it's obviously something an important piece of information that i'm sure members would take into account when they are making their decisions as to what match funding has been um, committed from other partner organizations but it's but no it's not it's not a formal it's not one of our criteria specifically final one on the chat so far and then we'll open it up um might need a bit of clarification oh somebody else is gone is this still find ring fenced um do we need clarification on that question is mike on the call Is this still find ring fenced? Yeah, I mean, Sandra, so I'm afraid it should be uh, fund, not find. What do you mean by ring ring fenced, Mike? Well, in the sense of is that money then, if it's not spent, does it go somewhere else, or can it be used for other things outside this, or is there a time limit on how long this uh, fund is available for? Um. Well, to answer your question, yes, it is ring fenced to infrastructure um, projects. So any any monies that aren't spent in a financial year will be rolled forward to be considered next year when the projects are considered next year. And that has happened in the past. Um, I think this year we spent all the money, but previous years there has been some money rolled forward. So yes, it doesn't get kind of dispersed with the um, budgets across the council. It is it is retained within the community infrastructure levy fund. It just gets carried forward to the next year. And um, no, there's no time limit for the spend of sill money or the allocation or spend of sill money. So in theory, the council could save up all its sill monies. If there was a really big project, I don't know, 20 million that they were just saving for, they could spend nothing for 10 years and then decide they're going to put all their money into one big project after 10 years. In theory, they could do that. So obviously the council, we haven't done that today. I think every year we've, we've allocated monies out, but but yes, to answer your question, the monies are ring fenced. And can I just ask one question while I'm on it? Is the, are there a number of SIL funds available or is this only this one? I know I mean for well, the, there's a, there's a No, there's just, there's just this one for the district council. The parish councils will have their own SIL funds. Some parish councils will have more money than others. It depends how much development's happened in their areas. Some, some will probably have zero amount. Some have probably got over 100,000. So it very much depends on a, uh, each parish council um, how much development they've had as to how much SIL they've had. Um, and then as Rachel mentioned earlier, each council areas will have a different SIL. Some councils don't have SIL at all. Um, and some do, so 
but I probably didn't ask the question well enough. Uh, what I meant was the total value of SIL money coming into uh, SDC that may be previous funds rolling over, uh, are there a number of uh, allocated funds or the total amount of SIL that uh, SDC are holding at the moment? Sorry, I didn't quite cut. What's the? Actual, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. What's, what's you, the total amount that we have? I, well, there's there's 1.3 million is available for this particular fund. Are there other SIL funds that uh, in the sales haven't been spent or are allocated for other projects in another round of this? There are, well, we've allocated previous projects. I think Rachel mentioned we've allocated up to three point something million already. Um, and obviously, if some of those projects don't come forward, then the monies will be put back in the pot. But but no, this is the this is the only sill pot that we've got available at the moment. And we do it on an annual basis. So we look to see how much money has come in at the end of the financial year. So as at the 31st of March, this was how much the 1.3 million is how much is available. And obviously, money is still coming in. I'm sure money comes in every day. And then next March, we'll look at how much has come in this financial year, and then we'll do another round of allocations next year. Okay, I'd uh, like to move on, conscious of time. Um, is there any chance if we can't meet the climate change mitigation criteria, it is worth submitting an application? On climate change, we, we score it whether it's um, significant positive contribution, mod moderate positive contribution, no contribution or a negative contribution so it does need to have at least a moderate positive contribution towards climate change um obviously because the council has um, declared a climate emergency and is one of the council's um top priorities then really we, we are looking for projects that have at least some positive contribution on climate change good well that's all of the in the chat uh like to throw it open to the floor. Um, if you'd like to raise a hand, um, and then I can come to you, hopefully in order, but I may, may lose the plot <laughs> if there's too many. Uh, any additional questions? No, we seem to have um, used the, used the uh, questions up. Uh, final call. Obviously, in the presentation which we said we would send out, there is a, an email address to contact uh, the team at Stratford District Council if there's anything further for clarification. Um, okay. In that case, what I'd like to do is just briefly just kind of uh, touch on some other potential capital opportunities and how Carver can help you if uh, you've got. Um, uh, capital project, uh, and then we'll we'll be well finished before seven thirty, uh, if that's okay. Um, so uh, bear with me in a second. Um, but, uh, okay. Yep. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Um, yep, so we've whizzed forward on the slides to where we finished. So how else can Carver help? Um, we obviously support voluntary and community groups and social enterprises. Um, we don't usually support the, the statutory sector, uh, but um, if we have some capacity, uh, we have supported parish councils in, in the past in particular in terms of funding searches. So one of the things we can do, for certainly for voluntary and community groups, is access uh, quite a variety of funding databases, um, uh, funds online, grants online, et cetera. And we have regular uh, funding newsletters that come into our inbox. Um, so that's uh, a service free free of charge. We Everything we do is free um, to support uh, groups if they want to seek capital funding. Certainly nationally, um, certainly after COVID, 
there was certainly a theme nationally that there was less capital funding about as funders diverted funds to COVID recovery, revenue funding, uh, and now the cost of living crisis. It's difficult to gauge as yet um, what the situation is nationally. So I think any capital funding uh, opportunity it, it should be well received. Certainly in terms of the databases that we can run, you know, with some of them access, you know, 8,000 sources of funding and certainly the charitable trusts that charities and voluntary groups can access can, can get up to eight billion pounds nationally. But not all of, it, not all of that obviously is capital, uh, but that some of it will, will be. So um, groups can come back and uh, we can assist them uh, in that search. Uh, one of the things, one of the funds that is uh, out there at the moment uh, is the Community Ownership Fund. This is part of the national government's levelling up agenda. Uh, and its purpose is to support those assets that are uh, risk of loss in your community. So quite a tight uh, uh, designation uh, and not everybody on the call, uh, um, if, if many at all, will, will meet that criteria. It is competitive and highlights there who can apply uh, and the money that is available on that. Um, there is uh, different bidding rounds. Um, we were able to support one particular group uh, last year that was at risk of closure and they secured £175,000 from this fund. So it is possible. Um, money is allocated uh, throughout, throughout the nation. More details are at the bottom uh, via the hyperlink. Um, next one is the UK Shared and Rural Prosperity Fund. We're not here officially um, presenting on that, so we, we can't any, answer any questions on that. Um, but just to say um, there was a round one last year. Um, and this is part, again, a part of the, uh, the government's levelling up fund. Uh, the previous year's information is via that hyperlink. Um, it should launch soon. Um, and initially, 3.5 million was allocated to Stratford upon Avon and 1 million to the Rural Prosperity Fund. Those are flexible, and I don't know exactly what money will be available in year two. The whole scheme, I think, ends in 2025. Uh, so if you've ticked the box to receive further information um, by signing up tonight, we will send you the information of that when it launches. But that should be very soon. Um, last year, and who knows what this year, uh, I think the lowest was £1,500. Um, there was some capital funding, as um, revenue funding, sorry, as well as capital. I don't know what the split will be for this year, this round. Um, I think the biggest amount a charity got was 95k uh, in year one. Who knows what, what the allocations will be uh, in, in uh, round two. But it, it's worth keeping on your radar if you're not aware of, of that as well. Um, another one, a traditional one, a National Lottery Community Fund. Um, uh, hyperlink there to uh, their information. Um, they do provide capital funding. Um, it's good, I think, if you haven't, as an organisation or, or as a group, applied for awards for all. Um, that is a relatively simple form, and it's up to 10K. Sometimes they will say, you know, they'd like groups to have secured the awards for all, delivered that, all the paperwork's gone in, back in on time, and... Um, you've developed some credibility with the National Lottery um, and hopefully more amenable to a bigger uh, funding bid. Uh, two project um, funding programmes, reaching communities and partnerships at the moment, but that's flexible and that changes uh, um, very regularly. And 
those two things are, would be over ten ten thousand um, pounds uh, for capital or, or revenue projects. Um, so just generically, um, top tips for any application. <laughs> um, some of these will be relevant relevant to what we've talked to today. Some perhaps won't. Uh, I think it's important to be aware all of this is competitive. Pre-COVID, um, the general rule of thumb was one in 10 applications nationally were successful for funding. Uh, there's been no kind of estimation since COVID, but money is more tight. Groups are seeking a lot more funding and, and core funding in particular. Um, I think one of the key top tips I would say in terms of mindset is be aware it's the funders' priorities, not yours. And really getting into that mindset that you're delivering on the funders' priorities, they're not supporting your, your priorities. And I think that's the happy medium is when those two things cross over, obviously. But I think that's really important in terms of any application. The guidelines, they're really important. Read them, read them again. Uh, you know, do you stand a chance of applying? You know, what are the guidelines? Do you meet those uh, to give yourself the best shot? Um, I think um, certainly the sill form is, is, I think, savable as you go along. But a lot of the ones I'd advise do, do all the pre-work in, in Word and just cut and paste into, uh, into documents. A lot of the application forms don't have um, spell checkers. So that's always a good tip. Key, I think, is answering the question. Sounds obvious. Um, I, I read quite a few applications where actually they've answered a question previously and think they've covered it, but actually they needed to answer it in question seven, say. They think they've covered that because they've answered it in section uh, question two, but you've got to put it in question seven if that's what they ask, because they won't go back and um, cross-reference. So really answer the question, that's really important. Have evidence of need, obviously the still information you've that was talked about today, uh, very reliant on the strategies that Stratford District Council has and the development plan, et cetera. All of those are available on the District Council website. And it's really important that you reference those uh, and have evidence of need in any funding application. Uh, providing all information requested is a really top tip. Um, funders don't like to come and ask you for more information. You know, they're not in a happy mood if they have to do that. So provide all the information requested. Be clear and concise. Um, you know, certainly if you've got to read a lot of applications, waffle and hyperbole it is not appreciated. Um, it's not going to get you any more, any more marks. Um, be clear and concise and submit on time, which is obvious. But uh, certainly, um, if you're needing help from organisations such as Carver and there's a weekend submission, don't wait till the weekend because we uh, unfortunately won't be able to answer the call. Uh, so submit on time is, is really important. Um, finally, uh, how can Carver help those voluntary and com community groups on, on the call? Um, as we touched on, we can do funding searches. Uh, we can help you get funding ready by that we mean a lot of funders uh, will need you to have the right policies uh, in place um, and we can help you with templates and other resources on that. Uh, we can sense check applications. Um, now, um, I don't know how this will go. We're, if we get a lot of information to help on this, this round and the shared prosperity, we've only got limited capacity, but generally we can sense check applications and give you some honest feedback on, on um, the application. We can also signpost to evidence uh, information such as health information, joint strategic needs analysis, information like that. Um, we, we can do that as well. And in a generally can act as a critical friend um, in relation to funding applications. We want the voluntary and group, the voluntary and community groups, to get as much money as they can to support uh, the, the the community um, that we're all part of. Um, so that's just a, a very quick 
Whistletop uh, tour of um, additional funding and how Carver can help. But I won't take questions on that because we're we're uh, we're not part of um, those those funds that were mentioned. So, um, any final questions before we we wrap up um, on SIL or anything that's come to mind uh, or how we can help going forward? No. Oh, Georgina. Um, my apologies, I've misunderstood. Um, one of your colleagues was talking about a 10 year limit on SIL funds, but my understanding was that they had a five year expiration. Is it different between town council and district council? Yeah, should I jump in on this? Um, yes, yeah, so for uh, town parish councils, um, the, if they're not, if the monies aren't spent within five years, then the district council can request the monies back um, to the district council. It doesn't have to, but it's got that option to do that. Um, whereas I believe for the district council, there isn't any, there is the district council monies, there isn't a deadline to spend. So yes, there is a difference there between district and parish. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one on the chat. I don't think uh, you might be able to answer this, but we'll, we'll see. Who is looking after funding help at oh the Rugby Carver office? Sorry, I thought you meant the Rugby District Council. That uh, is all. Uh, if you come on the call from elsewhere, obviously we we highlighted it at Stratford District Council, but you're very welcome anyway. That's no problem. Um, we have my equivalent in each of the districts and boroughs within Warwickshire. And if you go on to the Carver website, you can see who my equivalent would be in rugby, and that would be Lou Beddo. Um, so uh, that that would have all the information that you would you would need. Um, I think that's it on the chat. Um, I can't see any more um, hands. I'll just go on to page two. Oh. Uh, Paul has, has got, oh no, it's a, it's a clap. So <laughs> I thought it was a hand. Uh, so thank you for that, Paul. Um, so um, unless it was a question, Paul. No, no, it was a clap. So I think that's it. So I think that's it. I'd like very much to thank um, Stratford District Council's um, colleagues for taking time out from a very busy schedule, I know, with busy workloads to, to do the webinar. Uh, and above all, I'd like to thank you all for, for all what you do in the communities. Um, you know, they make communities better places for us all. So thank you and uh, good luck and uh, good night.